Hi, I'm Joy Bardwell. Welcome once again to Truth Unraveled. But first, let us pray. Father in heaven, the author and finisher of our faith, take a hold of our hearts now and let your Holy Spirit open our spiritual eyes to understand your truth. Amen. Today, I will be taking you to a little bit of background into the book of Genesis based on my observation after which I will be focusing on giving you a bit of insight into the first day of creation. Now, what do I mean by this? This is it. The book of Genesis is the book of beginnings, but notice the the prefix in the word Genesis. The root word is the word gene, and you know the word gene refers to um, gene as in your genetics. It is for this reason that the book of Genesis is not only a book about the the, um, beginning of creation, but it is also a book about generations and their activities. For example, you will have the beginning of um, generations in terms of farming, um, skills, tools, trade, uh, industry, cities, governments, and so on. Everything began in the book of Genesis. Now here's a sneak preview into my um, observation. The book of Genesis is called the Pentateuch. That means a five-fold book. And what it, what I find is that it is kind of a parallel to what you'll find in the five-fold ministry in the New Testament. The other thing is that um, I have also looked at the fact that the first um, 12 chapters you'll have the early history of Israel and the death of Joseph. But here's what I find. Apart from being a fivefold book, this book actually gives us five principal persons which are focused on in this um, particular book. First, Adam, chapter 1 to 3. And remember, 1 to 3 is actually looking at like the Trinity in the, th- the thought of numbering, numerology. And therefore, we have the the singleness of and unity of man with God, which is or it can be understood that that occurred in um, Adam, and two, the number two would have been like the witness of the Holy Spirit, and three would would have been the third person in the Trinity, which would have been Jesus Himself. Second principal person is Noah, and that is from chapter four to nine. Now, the number four is a number of earth. Uh, five is the number of grace and you know when there was that flood so there was grace that came about after the flood and six would be the number of man and seven is the number of completion that means everything was completed and um, at eight the number of new beginnings right there in um, that and then now number nine would have been as I talk, spoke to you about short of ten but there's something else Nine is the last digit in a number, and therefore it points to the end. And what happens, what I, what I mean by this, for instance, Jesus speaking about the, the end refers back to the time of Noah. There he said, as it was in the beginning, so shall it be in the end. The third principal person I find is Abraham, and that's from chapters 10 to 25. Now, as you know, 10 is the number of law and order and um, how did Abraham get into that let me show you in Genesis 26 verse 5 we are told that God speaking to um, Isaac his son by that time he said you know I'm going to bless you because of what the, the fact that Abraham he kept my laws my commandments my statutes and so we know that it would be looking back within the framework of chapters 10 to 25 so therefore and another thing um, number 11 would be speaking of what is measured number 12 government and so on and I could go through all of that but um, here's another point I want to make chapters 25 to 35 speaks of Isaac now the interesting thing about this that I find is that the age group in um, armies in the scripture like in the book of numbers and so on was selected from age 25 and 35. So what happened is that Abraham could not begin to have an army until um, Isaac was born, wherein Abraham would become the father of many nations. Now, you don't need an army if you if you don't have an, a nation. So you see how that works right there. Next, it's Jacob. 
and he picks up in chapters 36 to 50. And what I find interesting is that by the, if you're 50 years old, according to the scripture, you would be no longer be able to be enlisted in an army, neither could you be used, um, utilized to, into the duties of the temple at that age. That covers the whole scope of Genesis because Genesis has 50 chapters and in it God has his army ready for his duty. Now, as I have often pointed out, Isaiah 46 tends, tells us that God declared the end from the beginning. But what is that all about? The Bible itself is all about man's behavior. And what it actually teaches is that the behavior of man in the present determines his future. So that is how the end um, affects what is happening in the beginning affects the end of our lives. That, that is all what it's all about. That's what the Bible is all about. Our behavior in the present determines our future. Recall, we are told that God created, that means he formed. Everything was put in place. But then when we get to verse 2, we saw that everything became formless and chaotic. And what does that mean? It means Genesis 1 verse 1 in its strictest sense is about the beginning. But verse 2 is really about the end. Strictly, as, as you can see. In other words, the beginning and the end is totally wrapped up in verse 1 and 2 of Genesis, chapter 1. The end will be just as it was right here in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2. Here we saw that darkness was upon the face of the deep. And what is that? Um, over in Isaiah 60, verse 2, we read that um, darkness, deep darkness is upon the face of the, the whole earth and gross darkness upon the people. Now, the deep there refers to the word seas. And over in Revelation chapter 17, uh, I think it's verse 5, we are told that the seas represent the peoples, the nations and languages, the whole populace. And so what you're seeing here is that this darkness, which is have to do everything with our behavior. In fact, the word void here, as I go through the scripture, I discover that the word void from here on after Genesis refer to um, ignorance of the scripture. Um, lack of knowledge of God and so th and emptiness all the words that 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 are um, uh, um, the same to do with the word void occurs in our spiritual life so that is what um Genesis 1 verse 2 is all about this emptiness this void this 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 lack of knowledge of God lead us into deep darkness spiritual darkness and um, what can change that? This chaos, because darkness, this chaos is darkness. Um, only the Holy Spirit and the Bible says, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the deep. It will take only the move of God by the power of God, the Spirit of God, to change this deep darkness. And when that happens, then God says, let there be light. Because the Bible says God is not the author of confusion and neither is darkness in him because there's no darkness in him at all. So who does that? It's the devil. That's the work of the devil right there in Genesis 1 verse 2. It says, let there be light and there was light. Now, what is this light all about? The strict sense in Hebrew language, darkness refers to ignorance. Light refers to knowledge of God. And this is not the, the light as in the, the sky. This was talking about the light of God himself through the power of the Holy Spirit coming up on the face of, of the deep, changing the circumstance completely. A 360 degree turnaround. It was complete darkness and now there's complete light. And that is what God is going to do within our lives that the Bible speak of God taking us from the kingdom of darkness into his kingdom of light it will not be until you get to um, verse 14 that the actual light that we know that that controls the, the earth the sun and the moon is mentioned so this is not that light it has nothing that this is the Holy Spirit at work oh so God said let there be light and there was light. That's the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's exactly what God is going to do. This darkness that is upon the face of the earth is going to be completely changed by the time the Lord returns. In fact, the book of Revelation chapter 22 tells us that there will be no more sun or moon because God himself will be the light. Then verse, verse 4 tells us that God divided the light from the darkness. What does this mean? Well, what I've discovered is from that time onward to the end of the scripture, that's in the book of Revelation, all God has been doing ever since is making a division, showing separation. 
separating light from darkness, clean from unclean, holiness from unholiness, righteousness from unrighteousness. It's just all about that. Everything from here on, it's nothing but a separation. And you're going to find that it's all that is embedded right here in Genesis chapter 1. Verse says, And God divided the light from the darkness. He called the light daytime and the darkness nighttime. That's from the living version. Together they formed the first day. King James, another version says, And the evening and the morning were the first day. Notice God begins with evening, not morning as we know it. Why? That's because he's coming out of, everything is coming out of darkness into light. This point, there's something I want to point out clearly. Notice that God did not start by saying, you know, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. He started by giving numbers. He's a God of numbers. He's a God of measurements. Everything about God is just numbers. Notice that time was not divided by regular hourly division. What actually it was divided by was natural phenomena. Now, this tells me something. We are talking about the end times and um, people are looking at time as we know it. But what they need to do and, and scripture teaches it, like, for instance, in the book of Matthew um, 24, Mark 13, Luke 21 and so on. We see that God, Jesus explained to us that um, the end times, when he's explaining how the end times will be, he shows it by the natural phenomena that's going to take place. Darkness upon the land, you know, and stuff like that and earthquakes and all that sort of thing. So it's the natural stuff that God is dividing time by right here in Genesis and throughout the, the entire Bible to the end. This is a clue that God is giving us right here in Genesis that he divides time not by our of overly division, but by natural phenomena. That is wherein events occur successively within that time frame. Are you getting that? Let me repeat what I just said. God here does not divide time by in a regular orally division, but by natural phenomena wherein events occur successively within that time frame. So that is what we need to understand and that is what we need to apply to understand in the end times. So you say, okay, um, God declared the end from the beginning, but is there a timeline? Is there a particular time that we can mark? Is there something in the scripture that we can find that says this is when the end began and yes there is I have heard many preachers and, and evangelists everyone asking is this the end time or when is the end time but the scripture has told us clearly and I can't understand why they ask that question when it is quite clear so here's the scripture I'm going to take you to take a look with me at first Peter chapter 1 verse 20 here's what it has to say very revealing it says this that Speaking about Jesus, he says, um, who was foreknown indeed before the foundation of the world, but was manifested at the end of the times for your sake. The living Bible says God chose him for this purpose long before the world began, but only recently was he brought into public view in the in these last days as a blessing to you. Notice these last days at the end of the times. Some of the versions I did not put it up, but it says at the end of the age and so on. And um, so therefore we know that when was Jesus manifested? When was he revealed to us? When was he brought into public view? When that means he was born at the end of the age. That is where the timeline. And you notice all calendars are even um, marked fr from the time of Jesus' birth. Interestingly. Now, not only was he foreknown before the ends of the world and was revealed at the end of time, um, but According to Revelation 13, 8, we saw that the Bible says that he was slain before the foundation of the world. Therefore, that um, Revelation 13, 8 here is helping us to understand 1 Peter 1, 20 that we have just read. And what does this, what is um, Revelation chapter 13, 8 all about? The end of time. It's truly about the end of time. Everyone who reads the book of Revelation understand that all of Revelation 13 onward is really speaking about the mark of the beast, the image of the beast and all that. And everyone who speaks about prophecy and the entire Bible actually points to prophecy as it relates to, to this thing about the mark of the beast and so on. And as I have shown you before, that it is um, the opposite is for those whose names whom God have chosen from the before the foundation of the world, that is in Ephesians 1 verse 4, as I showed in the last clipping, that's the opposite. So it's, again, it's a matter of separation. The holy, 
as against those who are not holy. Those who receive this mark are those who are not holy. And I'm going to prove it to you in the um, in my next study. So may God wish the best to you. I want you to take a note of these things. I want you to embed them in your heart and begin to live for the Lord just as you ought to. Thank you for listening and may God richly bless you, my beloved. Thank you. God bless you.